Thank you, everyone. It's really an honor to be here and share a little bit. Um, so I'll try to share about all of our work in the, throughout the region, but I'm going to focus on one area we work is in Mongolia, because we do kind of all of our, the type of work we do everywhere, we kind of do it all there. And then it gives you a sense of space, and hopefully you'll learn about the work we're doing there. So as uh, was shared, I'm the regional ecologist. So I've been with SLT for the last three years. Um, but doing snow leopard work for the last eight years. So, the snow leopard. You've probably heard of them. They're elusive. They're on the high mountains, right? Um, they're the closest relative we normally think um, is the leopard. But the closest le uh, relative is actually the tiger. So the tigers are the closely genetic to the snow leopard. But the snow leopard has been hidden, really, from us um, in ecology and in history because they live such high altitudes and very remote areas. And we actually still do not know how many snow leopards still live in the world. So they remain elusive. But increasingly, as you might have seen on Instagram, Facebook, we're seeing more of them. You know, people are capturing them in the wild. But they're still uh, hard to see. And we still want to keep some of their mystery invisible. We want to keep them invisible in the mountains so that they can live for the future. But we do want to understand them more, right? And keep them visible in terms of their ecology and how we can conserve them. So that's the work we do. We try to really understand their ecology and put in place conservation programs on the ground. So just to give you an idea, this is the region of the Snow Leopard Range. So you can see they're found in 12 different countries in Central Asia. And the countries, you can just follow the border of China, and that's where you'll find the snow leopard. So this China holds around 50% of the snow leopard population, and they border almost all of the other countries. Um, so the, China plays a huge role in conserving the species. And uh, you can see that, I mean, they have such a large range, um, but they, each landscape is very unique. You know, you have high up in the Gobi area, they're all actually found at, uh, at around 1,800 meters. I'm not sure what that is in feet, but it's quite low in elevation and it's very dry. It's the Gobi. And then you find them also in the Himalayas, in the Tibetan Plateau, which is completely different and has much more snow, but it's also dry and it has a prey species. So the range is very different. And we actually still don't know if there are subspecies or if it's one species that there's exchange between the population. That we're still trying to figure out across the range. But what we know is they're found in also diverse cultures, economics, and political situation in Central Asia. Because each of these countries have their own realities and their own conservation and political situation. So, we try to assess what the threats are regionally, because it's not the same threats throughout their range. They vary a lot. And that means that our conservation programs need to vary regionally. It's not a recipe you know, of like putting one program in India and then just using it in India, in Mongolia. We say it's like raising a child, right? You raise a child, and you, you think you have it on the right recipe, and then the child grows up, and it's totally different. And you have no idea how to, to deal with that. And that's how, with conservation, we face a similar situation. You really have to think of the local situation and put into place uh, conservation practices that make sense at the local level and at the regional level. So that's what we do at the Snow Leopard Trust. We work with regional teams. So we have our head office here in Seattle. But in each country, we have our national teams that are actually different local NGOs that we partner with. And they are made up of national regional ecologists. And they do the work and the conservation work there. So we just help guide them and provide as much support as we can, financially, uh, technical support um, in any way, and provide also a kind of network between countries so they can learn from from each other. So the snow leopard, we often think of the snow leopard alone in the mountains, but they actually coexist with people. And people have been living with snow leopards for hundreds and thousands of years. So it's not a new phenomenon that there's conflict or snow leopards are uh, you know, a threat. 
they've been living with humans. So when we think of snow leopards, we don't necessarily want to just have them isolated in a protected area and then have people outside of these areas. That's old school conservation. We have to think of coexistence, people and animals across the landscape. Snow leopards also have huge home ranges. So if we want to protect snow leopards, we can't just protect one mountain range. They move between mountains. So that's about involving local people. And these people, they depend a lot, mostly across the range, on livestock. And of course, snow leopard preys on livestock sometimes. And that's what leads to some conflict with people, right? So we have to work with these people um, to help with the coexistence support so that the snow leopard has a long-term future. It's not just about the immediate safeguarding of the population. So here are the five countries that we primarily work, and we have teams. But we also increasingly work at the political level, because we realize we need these countries to be really engaged uh, at the national level and put into, uh, in place different policies to safeguard the species. Um, so we work with all 12 countries at the national level. So today, let's dive in a little bit closer into Mongolia. So in Mongolia, we've been working there since 2008. Um, and I'll just share a little bit more. Mongolia is the second most, uh, has the second most largest population of snow leopards. So I just told you China had the most, and the Mongolia is the second. And there, we don't really know, I'm gonna say they're around 100,000 uh, kilometers squared, but we don't really know. We just know that they're found in the south, in the Gobi, and then there's the Altai range to the um, west and uh, borders with China as well. But we estimate maybe 500 to 1,000 snow leopards, maybe. But we don't really have a good grip on this. Um, and the threats, well, globally, the main threats are habitat loss, prey reduction, and uh, human wildlife conflict and poaching. Those are globally the, the main threats. So when we talk about prey reduction, often we forget that we can't protect carnivores without protecting their main prey. And for snow leopards, their main prey is ibex and blue sheep. So these kind of like these mountain like sheep, wild sheep kind of species. Um, and so we need to really protect them. And when people are grazing and they have their livestock, and for example, in Mongolia, the number of livestock has increased a lot in the last 20 years since the 1990s and the collapse of the Soviet Union and end of communism in Mongolia. So there's been an increase in number of livestock. And then that has led to potential displacement of prey. So that's also a big threat that we try to work with. But in Mongolia, the main threats is also mining. There's huge new threats of large development within snow leopard ranges. Uh, for example, building roads, huge highways, trains, mining uh, for coal, for precious stones. It's happening not only in Mongolia, but throughout China and other parts of their range. So in a way, we living in these cities in the far west are very much connected to what happens in the, to the snow leopard through these kind of threats as well, in, the, in what we demand in our products and what we use. So in Mongolia, though, the main threats are poaching, human wildlife conflict, and mining, especially in the South Gobi, where there's a lot of mining taking place. So here, we've had a, a nice long-term study in the South Gobi since 2008. And it's a region called Tost. And Tost, here, as you can see, is, is not a protected area. So then blue is the protected areas. And then here is our study site. So red is where we think there's potential snow leopard population. And here we, we even guess potentially maybe there's snow leopards. So we've been working there since 2008 on a long-term study. And what we've been doing there, is, so let me sh share a little bit more about the area. You see these mountains? There are these isolated kind of mountains surrounded by the desert steppe. So it's, it's not kind of a habitat you would expect snow leopards. It's just these sudden, like, kind of rocky mountains. And we have a base camp there. And the area is around uh, 7,000 kilometers squared into the whole area. This smaller area is only around 1,000 kilometers squared. And it's now a local protected area. And people live on these, in these mountains. So this is a guesstimate around 200 herder families and potentially 40,000 livestock living in the area. But, we would like to know how many snow leopards are there. 
But counting animals is not easy, especially snow leopards, because they are so elusive and you can't like physically see them or you don't know if that's the same guy as the last guy. Um, so they live at very low population densities. We need to think of the large scale. Often we can't even access the areas. So this is a picture from China where I worked. And a lot of the areas, it was us physically needing to hike into the mountains, and we couldn't access a lot of the mountain areas to assess their population, which makes it really difficult. And um, it's hard because many confounding factors in our estimates. Um, so, so we try to use real robust methods to do this. So the old way used to be radio kind of coloring, you know? We, uh, snow leopards would be caught. There would be a collar you know, put on the snow leopard individual. And then we'd use radio signal to see where the snow leopard went. But you can imagine, there's mountains, the signal bounces, and you're running around to one mountain, and then you have to find the other signal from the other mountain. You go to that mountain, and you're like, I hope the snow leopard didn't move in between those three days that I moved. And yeah, OK, he was at that position. So that's what I mean. They worked really hard, scientists in the 1990s, 1980s, to get information. Because we didn't know how big an area they used, for example, their home range. And that was kind of information that was very important for their conservation. But unfortunately, using VHF, led to you know, potential bias results. Um, this is an example of some of the results from, uh, in Nepal from uh, Rodney Jackson. And you can see that he estimated that many of the different cats had overlapping home ranges. So they all lived in a certain area. And it's only around 20 kilometers squared. And, but maybe it's because he only could travel in this area. So he only could conclude that that's where the snow leopard was going. So recently, we've been working with more GPS collaring using satellite communication. And we get a signal every five hours on the snow leopard. So it goes from the collar to the satellite. And then it goes to our researcher at camp. And then we have data every five hours of where the snow leopard is. And these collars can last up to two years. So it helps us understand the species for up to two years. A lot of the time, this is a very invasive technique. Obviously, we understand that. And that's why we only do it in one area in Mongolia. And we don't just collar one or two snow leopards and be like, oh, wow, we collared. You know, let's get more funding. We're collaring snow leopards. It's about understanding the population. So we try to collar as many individuals in that one area to understand where each individual are using, whether their home ranges are overlapping, and looking over time how that changes. And uh, collaring females and males to see if there's differences, interactions. So that's very well planned and and is, has a bigger picture in, in conservation. So more about the collaring. So back in 2008, uh, three trapping areas were set up in the tossed area. And around since 2009, 30 snow leopards have been collared. And we have information on 30 snow leopards. So it's already a decent uh, sample size to kind of understand their ecology. And it's the most snow leopards ever collared in one area in the world. So what did we learn? So this is a picture of camp, by the way, in the area. So this is an example of some of the snow leopards caught between 2009 and 2013. And you can see these are the males here in the bottom, and these are the females. And sometimes some females were caught with their subadult uh, cubs. So we could watch how they interacted you know, and traveled around. And these, these individuals um, were captured several times and recaptured. And you can see there are some trap-happy cats that just would come back into the trap and just get caught and just kind of sit there. And our coloring expert, Orion, he was the one, he's from Sweden. Um, he was the one who was doing most of this trapping. And he knew all of these individuals very well. And there were some more feisty individuals that were not happy if they were collared again. So, uh, uh, so what did we learn from this coloring? Because that's more important. So from the home range estimates, we actually found out that female adults had up to 125 kilometers squared. Again, I'm sorry about the metrics. <laughs> I hope you guys know uh, a little bit about what kilometers squared are. But it's almost uh, 20 times the size that we had previously thought. In, uh, throughout their range. So it's a huge new discovery for snow leopards. And adult males even had a larger home range, up to 200 kilometers squared, which is massive. 
Um, and uh, yeah, 20 to 30 times. So this is an example of the males. You can see one male is here, one male is here, and another male. And you can see the home ranges do not overlap. We previously thought that they overlapped a lot because they were all found, you know, potentially marking the same areas. But coloring data suggests that they're quite separated and they do not interact. And this does not change seasonally as we had previously thought, or during the mating season or with changes in temperatures. Um, so uh, yeah, so they do not overlap as previously thought. And that's what the data demonstrates, especially between males. So with the coloring data, sometimes the snow leopard would catch prey, right? And it would stay with that area after it caught the prey for around eight days. <laughs> so when it did that, the points of where it's coloring and staying, we get a signal on the map. So those areas were visited to see what he was eating. Because our understanding of snow, what they eat has only been through scats, right? And that gives us a limited idea of what they're eating. So we tried to get live information of where, what they were eating and when. So over 300, or I think now it's around over 400, uh, prey areas were visited by the snow leopard to try to understand what did he eat. Was it goats or livestock? Was it wild prey, ibex? Um, and see if they ate all of it. You know, did they leave any behind? And from that data, we got also an understanding. We could know what, whether it was the females, the males, that captured these individuals. And one thing that was very interesting is we found that on average, they um, go and hunt one ungulate every eight days. So that's quite a lot. That gives us a more of an understanding of the need for how much prey they need in the area right, to survive. But also, we got an idea that they did kill more wild prey than livestock. You know, because a lot of uh, sometimes local people will say they just love our livestock. You know, they're just going to come back and keep killing. But this kind of indicated that they are killing prey, uh, wild ungulates, even when there are less wild ungulates than livestock in the area. But when it comes to um, goats and sheep, it was the adult males that would kill it two to six times more than the females. So. Why does this happen? We don't really know, but maybe the adult males are less fearless or more fearless than the females. And the females are more worried about their cubs. They don't want to take the risk of going into the corral, going into the human area to kill the goats and sheep. Um, so that, that was our understanding. Well, young males, however, killed no livestock. So maybe young males are really careful and they don't want to go into human areas. So, yeah. Also, the number of livestock versus uh, wild prey would change in the time of year. So there was less livestock killed during the summer than in the winter, um, which may be related to, because in the summer months, people would move out into the plateau and bring their livestock with them and then there would be less livestock loss. So it was more uh, showing that, demonstrating human behaviors. So let's talk a little bit about their dynamics. So we don't really know about dynamics between individuals. So here's a story about an individual snow leopard called Aztai. Here, Aztai was collared, and uh, he was a three-year-old subadult snow leopard. So Aztai was sharing the home range with another home, uh, snow leopard here, and then another snow leopard to the west. And we knew that he wasn't the dominant male. He was only three years old, sub you know, a young male. But he kept going into this area, you know, this other big male's home range. Then why does he keep going on these excursions? Do any of you guys have an idea of why? Females. <laughs> There were two females in this area, and he potentially did not have females in his home range. So he was potentially going on excursions, seeing what the females were doing. But then what happened is one day that male, dominant male, died. So he died, and Astai knew and figured out that that male died, and between, within two weeks, he moved home ranges and took over uh, the dominant male's home range. And this is the kind of information we would have never really known without the coloring, which is really interesting because then maybe Astai became the more dominant male in the region, taking over. 
So that's the story of Astai, which does not actually end very well. Astai was last signal came from a corral um, in one of the herder livestock near their home. And we do not know for sure, but potentially Astai was killed in the corral um, because he was killing their livestock and goats. So, the, um, so it ends a little bit sad. But that's the kind of information we also get from the collaring because these are people that have been engaged with conservation programs for now over 10 years. But if a snow leopard comes and visits their corral and keeps visiting, and that's what happens, you know, a week later the snow leopard will come back and again eat their livestock. The last thing you can do is just sit there and watch. You know, you set up a trap because you don't really know if it's a wolf or snow leopard. You might know, but you have to do something about it. You can't just let your livelihood be eaten away right in front of you. So we recognize that there's conflict, even with people that are pretty aware and engaged in conservation programs. So another interesting thing is, so this is Tost, where we were talking about before. This is Nimic, the mountain to the north. So snow leopards stay with their mom, the cub and the mom, for up to two years. And she might have like three or two cubs, and then they grow up together, and they only stay with her for two years. The male uh, left ages ago. Uh, he didn't even see the cubs. And they grow up to around two years, and they become quite as big as the mother. So you might see pictures of groups of snow leopards, but it's actually the mother with her big cubs. Around two years old, the, mother, the cubs will leave their mother and look for a new home range, because they need to find their area. So we often don't know where they go, because they're dispersing. They're going into the area. Do they stay and tossed? Do they go to other mountains? Do they travel like hundreds of kilometers? We, we have very little information about this. But we've learned a lot from collaring. So this is an example of one of the subadults leaving his mom and then traveling and actually settling in Nemecht, which is around 80 kilometers in distance. However, other collared cats have traveled over 300 kilometers squared looking for a home. They'll just keep traveling until they find a home that they can settle in. And obviously, it will depend what other males are there, what other females are there. Um, but it, this is a really dynamic process that we, have, we don't have a full understanding on yet. And we're trying to still understand about dispersal, because it's important for landscape planning of conservation in the different areas. And also, if this becomes all developed, for example, one day in the future, that's going to limit snow leopard dispersal. So back to uh, the collaring, what we've learned from collaring. We also have an activity loggers in the collars of those uh, snow leopards. So you kind of understand their movement, you know? And we ex what would you expect uh, snow leopards uh, to be doing half the time? You might expect them to be hunting, right? Because they're hunting they're wild prey. They have to wait. They have to be on the mountains, you know, moving around. They're moving around. They're roaming their home range. Um, you would expect to be, uh, for them to be doing that. Um, but snow, so snow leopards in the Gobi spend around 40% of their time on kills, based on the collaring data. So we thought, OK, we've got that data. Let's take away that period they're with their kills. So what's the rest of the time? What are they doing? Are they probably also running around, right? We expect something like, like this. They're jumping around, they're moving, they're interacting. But no, their actual pattern, they're sleeping, barely moving most of the time, lying down in the sun or storing their energy. So this is an example of their activity pattern <laughs> in the middle of the day <laughs> from collaring. So this is, that was a, an example of what we know from collaring. But a lot of the range of snow leopards we can't collar because logistically, politically, it's very sensitive. Um, so we need to find something that's more economical. And we use the, the camera trap. This is a Reconyx camera trap um, that uh, gives very good quality of snow leopards. So this is a remote sensed. So the snow, if the snow leopard walks in front of the camera, it will take pictures of those individuals. So this is an example of uh, Puji, our colleague in Mongolia, setting up a camera. And just a little bit later, you'll see uh, a snow leopard come by. 
So we get many photos. You can see, you know, it's not only snow leopards we catch, we catch wolves, we catch uh, more snow leopards, but it, it's anything that moves and uh, hits, uh, then the, it's a motion censored camera, will capture the pictures. And again, again, like livestock. So in Mongolia, we have the longest uh, camera trap study in the world. So since um, this is an example of our camera traps over the area. And this allows us to keep track of this, those individuals over the long term, because with coloring, we're limited to certain individuals. Here we can monitor how many females, how many have cubs, how many males are, are in the area. And we used to think quite high densities of snow leopards live throughout their range, but we found that in this area, for example, there's around 13 snow leopards. So that's less than one snow leopard per 100 kilometers squared. So less than that, which is much lower than we had previously thought. So they're not found at very high densities. So this is an example, again, of a mother and a cub. So we, we can actually know these individuals uh, and follow them and follow and see the cubs and then try to see if they stay with their mother, if they move between mountains. Um, so here's also a video of a mother and a cub. And you can see, ooh, I'll press play. So you can see that the mother, mother and her cub, So here's Anu and her cub, and they're both collared here, and they're traveling together uh, throughout the mountain. And they're traveling, they're traveling, they're always together. You see, they stay very much together. And then there comes a time when F11 is old enough and is ready to leave mom. It's going to come. She's not ready yet. OK, now she's coming around February. She decides to leave her mom, and you'll see that they they still kind of interact, right? She leaves and then she kind of comes back, sees mom, leaves again, comes back, and which is very different. Uh, we didn't really expect that. Calling data is kind of suggesting that they interact much more than we actually expected. Here's another example of a female with her male cub this time. This one is slightly different. They're traveling together again, uh, you know, potentially hunting together. Um, uh, very much the same areas, still traveling together, still traveling together. And then on March, Eyelash decides to leave his mom and he goes boing all the way really far and just stays there. It's traveling really far. So that was another example of dispersal. So with camera trapping, another thing we can do is we can cover much larger areas. So now we're covering most of the South Gobi. And other organizations are covering the west of Mongolia. So we're collaborating with them to use the same methods. And in that way, we'll kind of understand the population of snow leopards throughout the range. Um, another good news is that in the area we've been collaring, in the area we've been doing conservation work, it's now a nature reserve, which is really good for the area because actually a lot of the area was uh, being given up for mining. So we were, the herders, though, however, stepped up and said, we do not want the area to be uh, given up for mining. And they are the ones that wanted it to be a nature reserve. So we supported them in that work to set up TOST. But yeah, so it's more than just numbers. We try to redefine the distribution maps, understand threats, understand the priority areas we need to work. And we engage a lot with uh, local people, local rangers, because they're the ones that are doing a lot of the work. We're just here supporting them. And, uh, and we try to also work with different uh, governments in the area to try to have them understand um, uh, how, what methods to put in place that are the most cutting edge methods. Um, we try to understand also the dynamics. So from the, what I told you happened to Aztai, and he got killed in that corral, that led to us realizing maybe we needed to support the communities by setting up these corrals. Um, and these uh, metal corrals were put around these traditional corrals. And since then, I think we've only put out around 20 so far, but no uh, livestock have been lost inside these uh, 
more predator-proof corrals since. So we try to find these local solutions that make sense. Um, and we, were, we also uh, uh, try to consider wolves, because snow leopards are not the only carnivore in the area that are causing conflicts. There are other carnivores, such as wolves. Um, so we try to have our programs address those kind of conflicts as well, because in the end, if people are also trying to reduce the number of wolves, it's going to negatively impact, impact snow leopards. So we have a range of conservation programs at the local level where we try to engage with local communities. So that is them helping protect the snow leopards. And it's coming from them. So we often engage with uh, engage with communities and ask them what they would like to do to help conserve this snow leopard and what makes sense at their local level. Um, so we have a range of different programs throughout the area. We have uh, handicraft schemes to support women to, to give so that they become snow leopard champions in the local communities. We have livestock insurance programs, corrals, we have education programs. We have uh, also prey village reserves to help protect areas for prey. So a range of different schemes. And as you can see, they really differ across the range, um, depending on what makes sense there. Um, so these are just example, a few examples of what we do. Here are a few of the corrals in uh, Mongolia to help protect against uh, the livestock. And here's one from India. As you can see, it's very different, the reality over there, because the corrals are much smaller and more connected with the homes, right? So it's a different kind of predator proof you need to put in place. And this is an example of our livestock insurance. We provide um, the funds initially, but also the community provides the funds. So it's like 50-50. And then, uh, and then they feel much more ownership over the, the program, and they don't try to just let their snow leopard, uh, their livestock, you know, roam freely. They really try to also prevent losses through the program. Um, and handicraft programs, engaging with women, because we really feel often it's the women that feel this kind of more negative attitudes towards large carnivores uh, we've seen through our research. So we really need to engage them as well, um, because they can be more of the champions across the range. So that's a bit about of our work. Um, so we're working, yeah, across the range and some examples. Um, I think what the main thing about the conservation work, though, is that we're finding it's not necessarily about just reducing losses about increasing snow leopard numbers. It's really about trying to promote the resilience of communities. Because in the end, there's a lot of these emerging threats that are coming. It's like climate change. Also, poaching might be a huge emerging threat with the illegal wildlife trade that hasn't influenced snow leopards to a major, major degree, but might influence them even more. So we need to get ready for those kind of emerging threats. And it's through engaging with communities that we can do that. Because if poaching does become a huge issue, these local communities can hopefully prevent uh, external hunters coming in or be more resilient to that kind of threat. So thank you for listening. And I just want to say thank you uh, to Google, because through our Google Ads, we've actually uh, had over uh, $4 million uh, uh, supporting the Snow Leopard Trust, which is huge. So thank you guys for inviting us and for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll leave you with a, a little video of a snow leopard in China with our cub. Thank all of you for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.